Windows networking. So I've mentioned before that we have work groups and we have domains. When you deal with a work group, you're dealing with a small office, home office environment. Generally no more than about 10 machines. After that it gets a little unwieldy. Domains on the other hand are used for large scale networks. Usually anything from 5 and above computers. Now in that 5 to 10 range you can use either a work group or a domain. Um, domains cost money though because you have to have a Microsoft server to run a domain and that can get expensive. So that's usually why you're going to see um, people start going to domains at about 10 users, although ideally at around 5 you really wouldn't want to go to a domain. It allows a lot more control over your capabilities. Um, to figure out if you're on a domain or not, if you go into your system properties and under computer name you'll see here, for instance, this is a work group on the left side. If we wanted to join a domain on the other hand, we would click network ID and then instead of using a work group, we would check the domain button and type in whatever our domain is. For instance, here at school, we use AACC as our domain, right? Um, a lot of places will use corp as their domain because that is corporate, right? Uh, and you'll see that often in a lot of places. Um, and then you'd hit OK, it would ask you to reboot the computer, and it would join that domain. In Windows 7 and above, we talked about the fact that there's home groups. It allows us to have this easy to manage and secure small office, home office network, like a work group, um, but it allows us to go through this little setup wizard, and it makes it a lot easier for us. So for instance, as you're going through the home group, it'll say, hey, do you want to share things with other people on the network? Things like your pictures, your music, your videos, your documents, and your printers. Um, in your home, you may want to do that, where you can, everybody in the family can share their pictures or everybody can share their music. Um, this works really well in a small environment. Again, about five people. If you have more than that, it starts getting a little unwieldy as you're trying to locate all these documents on different people's machines. Uh, file and print sharing. We use this to reliably share files, folders, and printers across a network of XP, Vista, 7, 8, and 10 clients. So if we have any of those uh, Windows operating systems, they can all use Microsoft file sharing to do this. If you want to share a file or a folder, all you do is right click on that folder, go to properties, and then click on the sharing tab. And then you can click the share button and you'll be able to share it. Uh, we'll go into sharing a little bit more when we do labs about how to actually share these files securely. But you can actually add in the advance, you can set permissions up. So I can say, okay, um, these folks have access to read my files. These folks have access to read and write my files, right? And you can change those things as needed. Same thing with a printer. If you right-click on your printer and go to Properties, click on the Sharing tab, you can give it a name, click Share this printer, and then you'll allow people to share your printer across the network as well, even if it's connected directly to your machine through USB. Uh, network shares and mappings. Uh, we can map a network resource for ease of access to it later on. So let's say, for instance, on David's computer, which we're going to call Dave's PC, um, he has a file that I want, a folder that I want to be able to map to, and I'm always connecting to him every time I'm in the office. Well, I can actually call drive letter Z, and that'll map to David's hard drive. And so, for instance, I would go and click on, <clears throat> I would go over here to computer, right click and go map network drive, and on the right hand side you can see it brings me to this wizard where I give it a drive letter and I give it a path. And the path is written as a universal network locator. And the way that's done is slash slash computer name slash share folder. So in my case it was slash slash seven simulator is the computer slash share files and that way it connects me that server and that share to the Z drive. And so from now on I can just type in Z colon and up would pop David's files. You can configure your network connections as well. And the way you do this is you can access the setup a connection or the network wizard through the network and sharing center on Windows 7. In Windows 7 on the bottom right hand corner, you'll see it looks like a computer with a trident. It's actually a computer with a network cord to it. Um, you can click on that and that will open the network sharing center. And from there you can click on set up a new network or connection and then you'll follow through the prompt. So if we want to connect to the internet, we would do that. If we want to set up a new network, we could do that. If we want to connect to a workplace through a VPN, we could do that, or a dial-up connection, and follow through those wizards. Very similar to what we had in XP, we just access it a little bit differently. So different kinds of, v uh, of different kinds of network connections we can use. One is a VPN, and a VPN is what's called a virtual private network. It allows our user to connect back to work remotely over the internet or using a dial-up connection, and access shared resources as if they were sitting there at their work computer. So if I go and click on the connect to a workplace, in the previous slide you can see I had that connect to a workplace option. 
I can then type in my internet address, like vpn.google.com, if that was my address. Um, I would give it a name, Jason's Work or VPN Connection, and then I would hit Next, and it would ask for my username and password. Now, every time I connect to it, it creates an encrypted tunnel between my computer and the work that I'm trying to access, and then we can send our data back and forth at that point. The next way we could do things is dial-up, and dial-up is an older technology. We talked about this back in part one. Um, it uses your old analog phone line to create a dial-up to create an internet connection. Very rarely are you going to use this anymore. But if you need to, you can click on the create dial-up connection, give it the phone number, your username and your password, and then hit create, and it will create that connection for you. And that way, every time you double-click on that dial-up connection, it will dial into that service provider and connect you to the internet. Another thing you can do is you can create a cellular dial-up. A lot of these are treated as dial-up connections. Some of these will be treated as wireless networks over private hotspots. It depends on your cellular device. Either way, you're going to go ahead and click on that set up a network connection, and you'll be able to connect from there. If you have a wireless connection, which is extremely common in today's networks, usually you're going to see the little wireless icon next to the time clock. And you'll click on that, and then all your wireless device networks will show up and you can click on one to join it. When you try to connect to one, it will ask for your password if there is one, and you'll connect that way. If you need to manually create one, you can do that again through that setup wizard we were just talking about, and you'll give it a wireless name for the SSID, the CorpNet-Wireless, for instance. You'll give it what type of encryption it's using and what the, the password is that you were given. Um, that'll allow you to connect, and this is probably the most popular way that you're going to see people connect in home networks. Um, this and then wired networks, but wireless is by far taking over. And the last way is wired networks. This is a network connection that we can dynamically use using DHCP dynamic host control protocol, or we can statically assign it. If we go into the properties, for instance, and we click on IPv4 and then properties, you'll bring up this screen. If you have obtain automatically, that's DHCP. If you use the following IP address and you type in the information, that's statically assigning it. Okay? If you statically assign it, remember you have to have an IP address a subnet mask, a default gateway, and a DNS server to have a full-fledged internet connection. If you do DHCP, it will configure those four things for you automatically. One of the things you can do is we were just looking at this general tab. You can click on the alternate configuration. And if DHCP fails to assign a valid IP, the alternate configuration will be used. This is useful when you actually have something like by default, it's usually using the uh, a PIPA address, the automatic private IP address. But let's say you have something where you use DHCP at home, but you use static IPs at work. Well, one of the things you can do is you can configure it to be DHCP primarily, and then if you go to work and they don't use DHCP, you can use the alternate configuration to provide you with your work static IP. And that way, whenever you connect, it'll automatically switch over for you. Uh, th this can be very useful for that type of an environment. Most of the time, though, people are going to use an automatic private IP address as their default. Network card properties. So in our network cards, we can actually change certain properties. For instance, um, we can go through the device manager and click on the advanced tab. And you can see in the middle here, I have the link speed and duplex. And you can select auto negotiation, which is default, where your laptop card is going to talk to the um, wired switch and they'll negotiate how fast they can talk. But maybe that's not working properly. You can go in here and actually change it and put it back to full duplex. Because sometimes you'll have a negotiation and maybe there's some interference the first time you negotiated and they, and they talk and the switch goes, oh, you're pretty slow. Let me talk to you at 10 megabits per second, half duplex. And you're wondering, why is my network going so slow? You can go and do the advanced here and tell it, no, I don't care what the switch says. You're going to operate at 1,000. And you're going to operate at 1,000 full duplex. Um, and you can change that setting here. And we talked about that full and half duplex back in networking, but that's one of the places where you can change that. Um, so you can change your duplex, your speed, your power over Ethernet settings, your quality of service, whether or not you want the LAN to be able to wake up your computer from sleep. Those type of things are all able to be changed in the advanced settings here for your network card. Proxies. So a proxy is used to increase the responsiveness of web browsing and aid in the security of the network. So if you're at work, or even here at school, when you go on the internet, you're not going from your computer directly to the internet. Instead, you're going to our proxy server. And our proxy server looks at your requests, and it will decide whether or not 
it either A, is going to allow you to go out and get that request, B, it's going to block you, or C, it already has the information and it'll give it to you locally. Okay? So for instance, I go to CNN.com. A minute later, Nicholas goes to CNN.com. The proxy server already went out to the internet, got the information for me for CNN.com, so it doesn't need to go back out there. It's just going to give Nick the copy it just gave me. And that will speed up web browsing because we don't have to use the WAN connection, right? Um, conversely, let's say we're sitting here at school and you try to go to a gambling website or a pornography website. It's going to block you from getting there. It's not going to allow you to do that. And it's going to give you a message on your screen saying you are denied by the proxy. Okay? This is a malicious site or this is a, a, a goes against our policy. So proxies are used for that. To configure that, you go into your internet properties and click on connections. Down at the bottom you hit LAN settings and then you'll put in the proxy address in the proxy server block as you can see there on the screen. Uh, in this case it's done using an IP address. You could also use it based on a name address depending on how it is. When you initially connect to a network on Windows 7, it's going to ask you, is this a home, a work, or a public network? If you're at home, click on home. If you're at work, click on work. If you're on a public area, you want to click on public. And by defining what type of network it is, it is going to increase or decrease your firewall settings to protect you better. If you're home, you're going to have less settings. If you're in public, it's going to put up shields because it's not going to trust anybody. So a good example of that is if I'm over at Starbucks, I don't want my file sharing enabled because I don't want other people getting my files, right? But if I'm at home, I want my file sharing enabled because my wife needs to be able to get access to the documents on my computer. And so by having that work versus public, it'll allow you to do that. Remote desktop. So with remote desktop, under system properties, you can click on remote, and you can allow remote assistance from this computer. This is like Dave sets this up at home so that later tonight I can go into his computer remotely and fix his problems, right? This allows authorized users to remotely connect over the network and take control of your machine. If you want to allow that, you click on the allow connections from computers, running the remote desktop with the more secure version. If you don't want to allow it, click on the don't allow and nobody will be able to get into your computer this way. Again, in a corporate environment, this is usually turned on because our IT staff loves to do remote work. Saves us the time of going to each person's computer individually. Saves us a lot of time. We can get more done with less people. Firewall settings. So again, our firewalls, we're going to configure them. We're going to customize the rules for accepting or denying external traffic. And we can make exceptions for specified software. So maybe by default, we don't allow peer-to-peer -peer software to work. But Skype is something we do want to work because we want to be able to talk to grandma. right? We can put an exception in here that allows Skype to get in and out of the firewall. Um, and so you can enable or disable the firewall entirely if you want to. It's not recommended. It's better to leave the firewall on and just put exceptions in for those specific programs or games that you're trying to use. So here's a sample question for you. A manager needs to have remote access at the main office at all times. What would be the best setup? So if he goes home and he wants to be able to do work back at the office, what's the best way to do it? VPN, Virtual Private Network. It'll allow them to either dial up or use over the internet connection, which is what most people use nowadays, is an IP VPN tunnel. Uh, and they will VPN back into work, creating that, and they can actually print documents and access file shares and everything just as if they were sitting in their work computer. 